Are we cool? Are you all ready? All right? Um, all right. First up to the mic is Charlotte Rose. She is a singer, rapper, writer, poet, and visual artist from St. Paul, Minnesota. Her contagious creative spirit flows through her artwork, which is always bold in concept and honest in delivery. Charlotte Rose is unap unapologetic in her self-expression. It is known for inviting the inner artists of her listeners to join her in play as she explores the world around her through artistic conversation. And I believe this is the first time you've performed at the loft, right? So everybody give a warm welcome to Charlotte Rose. Thank you. Thanks for coming to listen. I'm not sure what making love is, but I know this, that the closeness that I feel when we do, the physical is emotional and mental, and that's the reason that I'm into you. There's only so much space in my brain. Some of it filled with memory, so some of it filled with pain. Some of it filled with anxiety, so some of it filled with shame. Some of it filled with wandering thoughts of what is love or is us or are us, and all of it filled with art that I'm ready to share again. And lately, most of it's filled with you. And everything else floats in my cerebral sea of blue. Swimming with fish the color of your hair and your eyes. Teeming with seaweed so green that it shows through mine. And you see this, you know this, you notice you're my focus. You're the abyss I fall into when they ask me, what you been doing? So I tell them the truth, there's no time for lies. Because I once heard from someone I consider to be wise that there ain't much left in this world that can't be cheated. Sad, isn't it, how prevalent the bullshit is? Open up any magazine, newspaper, or browser and read it. But really, I just need you to know that I won't ever cheat you. No matter what horrible, unspeakable atrocities you commit, or hurtful or absent acts that you do, and that is truth. And this is heart that skipped the mind and flowed straight through my veins, through this pen to this paper to make art. So tell me, do, do you feel me? Are we on the same page or even the same plane? I hate to rush, but I need to know. What are we? What is us? A similar question sparked the coal to ignite the train that almost missed us. Has fate bent down from the heavens and kissed us? Is this a temporary stage like middle school, like sixth grade? A learning experience worth no points and no pay? I need to know, but I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to fall asleep each night with a smile for the next day, unknown and ungrown, but we water while we wade. And maybe we move too fast through time, but we don't have much, so claim yours and I'll claim mine. And maybe we're carefully stacking the Jenga so that when it falls, it hits us both in the laps and knocks us back, and maybe not, and that's all. Ride, because we deserve each other. And if either of us were murdered, the world would die of hunger. And not from lack of fluids first, because the love in our souls would quell our mother, our sister, our brother, our sons, and our daughter's thirst. And that was We Water While We Wade. I need to explore, rediscover my own body in order to reclaim what's mine from the captor that caught me. See the bullet holes from where the wolves have shot me. I'm lucky, I left a trail of blood, but they never got me. Sometimes I find it hard to believe somebody really loves me, wants to listen to me, learn the curves of my body, memorize my past just to do the opposite. Love is now found, it's good now, like I promised it. And whether or not this is ever heard, my spirit shines through, lighting every adjective, noun, verb, or other classification of word. A new illumination, the greatest in meditation have learned. So seen or unseen in another moment. By other eyes of the three, I was gifted by the comet. Right now, this rap is the realest I've ever written. Right now, this poem is the purest that's in existence. Snake eyes on their faces, I chose it before I rolled it. I never claimed to be savior or prophet or chosen. I put myself here to make choices in every moment. That's why sometimes all the responsibility, it's hard to shift it. That's why historically, I pack a bowl and get lifted. I worry for my vocal folds for a minute because I ripped it and pray the green enhances me being lyrically gifted. All I've ever asked is to meet all my heroes, cure all diseases, eliminate De Niro's, save all the babies, stop all the fevers, make pessimists into believers. And the people feel the change, I can feel it. Because the people are me and I'm intuitive as I ought to be. Used to feel like property. Now I got a love that really knows what to offer me. How to treat me properly. How to hold my hand and my head simultaneously. How to lead me to joy and how to really rock with me. I wonder if he'll stay and I think, probably. 
But who doesn't worry about being alone again, now and again, besides the lucky people never felt it to begin with? The events I call my memories, you'd probably give me sentiment and sing me praise to hurry my core development, the progression of my story, but I worry that I'm the one the blame sits with, like, who invited all the creepy crawlies to our picnic? I'm sorry, excuse them, they're mine, that one's a little out of control, I saw it nip you from behind, I'll try to leave him next time, but he bites me too, every night, as soon as my eyes close and my passion starts to ignite, and the only way to stop him is to listen and rewind, he's singing a song on his wings when he flies, I try to strip it off him all the time, but he won't let me, cause the song is his spine and the bug is my memory, so what's his and what's mine when we're singing the same tune in harmony? But as far as actually harming me, he used to bite deeper, and in the presence of my keeper he gets weaker. In fact, he hardly bothers me. I'm learning how to heal myself, get my energy aligned. Talk to me, tell me what's going in your mind. He tries to take it off me because he's kind to me. I had a couple of friends over in high school. We ate each other out and the whole school knew within days, word of mouth. Stuck with me these feelings I'm still trying to figure out like, where is there a place for this and what's it all about? I'm doing it alone, I won't let him help me now. I've never known an exorcist to take a demon out when the demon was so deep-seated it wasn't a demon at all. And maybe I'm just different or I'm willing to admit it, but we're too divine not to appreciate other women and men appreciate men and we'll all love each other. It's so clear to me that I'm normal, but I still won't tell my mother, my best friend, or my sister. I'm afraid to have to wonder what they're thinking undercover, but I kissed her. And I can say that about a small few. And each time I did it, I ignited a small fuse. And the more it's in my thinking, the more that it burns through any hesitation I had about my true colors, a rainbow. I guess I'm not straight or gay, though. I go straight past Pluto, I go fast as Lyco, I'm part of human evolution so my flow is of the new flow. I value my process so I grow as I go. I grow as I go, I grow as I go. Thank you. Thank you, and that was I grow as I go. One more time for Charlotte Rose, everybody. She had it memorized and everything. I can't even remember, you know, I have a padlock I used to go to the gym. It's like three numbers. Three numbers, I can't. Every time I got to look it up, like, what is, what's the combo? Uh, fucking the gym and shit. Anyway, okay. So wonderful job, you did great, thank you. Wonderful, um, too real, it's too real. Um, thank you for that wonderful performance, you're wonderful. All right, up next we have Marissa Carr. Marissa Carr is a writer, actor, and musician based in Minneapolis. She is an alum of the Inroads for Native Writers program at The Loft and is thrilled to be returning to EQ, and we are thrilled to have you back, dear. It's always good to hear your work. She is a 2015 recipient of the Jerome Foundation's Naked Stages Fellowship, and her solo show, Static, will be running at Pillsbury House and in, in Theater December 10th through 19th. She is, the Turtle Mount, she is of the Turtle Mountain Ojibwe from the Turtle Clan, uh, give it up, everybody, for Marissa Carr. Thanks, you guys. So, I'm not memorized. It's pretty new, though. I usually make fun of people who do iPhone poetry, but, you know, the last... I don't know, two or three times that I've been at EQ, I've been recycling the same stuff. And I was like, man, I gotta do something new tonight. I gotta. So, you know, we'll see. Something's gonna happen. I don't know what it's gonna be, but you guys are about to find out. So here we go. This is called, When You Wake Up After a Dream About Genocide. Do not think about the bodies. Do not think about how they stacked, stacked, stacked like tally marks in an infographic from hell. Do not think about their faces. Don't try to remember how they looked like everyone you love. Try not to think about love. When you wake up after a dream about genocide, make yourself believe that everyone has these same strands of trauma woven through their DNA and sometimes loses control of the lockbox they've built in the back of their brain. So, you don't get to be afraid. 
Do not card the fuzzy fibers of your dream over and over in your mind, hoping they'll become smooth. Don't run through them with a knit comb, trying to loosen the eggs of your dream before they hatch into the sound of bombs going off. They will never lie smooth. They will always be ugly. Hide under the covers like smallpox blankets could keep you safe. Hold your eyes closed just a minute longer. Will yourself, when you open them, to see the earrings on your nightstand that you never put away in yesterday's dirty laundry on your bedroom floor. You are not a refugee. You have never lived through a war. Dream of genocide, and when you wake, reflect that you rested on land where 38 hanged, and remembering bad old boarding school days still turns your grandma's pretty brown face gray, and women who could be your sisters go missing every day. Say a quick prayer of I'm sorry to the ghosts of your dream. Try not to think about their faces. Don't remember that they could be the same people that you love. Try not to think about love. No, you could be better. After you dream of genocide, run the faucet until the water comes out ice cold and splash, splash, splash it on your face until you're almost positive you're awake. Make a cup of tea. Let it warm your hands, and as it steams, wonder if ghosts can dream. Thanks. Please don't clap, though, because I only have five minutes. I have five minutes at the very max, and I want to try and do another one, but I can only do that if you guys are quiet right now. But thank you. You're so kind and lovely. You're lovely. <laughs> you know what, though? Honestly, my lipstick was on point when I left my apartment, and then I ate a salad when I got here, and then I was sitting here right before we started, and I was like, oh my god, I bet my lipstick is all fucked up. But it's too late for me to do anything about it now, so I'm just going to have to stand up in front of all these people with imperfect lipstick. So thank you. You're so kind. I love you all. <laughs> We were swaddled at birth in secondhand tragedy, threadbare but still intact. Borrowed, stolen, or passed down, we slip into it like an old coat that becomes a straight jacket that becomes a, sh a shroud. Wear it with the same desperate tensity that makes us thumb our bruises and linger long after everyone else has gone home in the places that hurt us the most. The same that makes us refuse medicine for fear that we won't be healed. For fear of not knowing how to be without the chips on our shoulders that have grown down into our bones. For fear of success or failure that plucks away at the possibility of hope. When my brother and I were young, we patched each other's scrapes and punctures, packed them with cotton balls and sealed them with masking tape, always so carefully because when he broke his hand, my fist used to ache. This is how I know that when you close a wound that's never been cleaned, it festers and burns. This generation has learned to wear scars with cockeyed smiles that pop up on autopilot when old friends or bold strangers ask, what the fuck happened to you? Crack uncomfortable jokes and laugh too loud so they'll know that we have nothing to hide, that the railroad tracks of tissues that traverse our limbs are too old to matter, that they stopped hurting us years ago, and we're just fine but sometimes they still keep me up at night. And when I finally sleep, I dream of atomic bombs, unjust wars, the Middle Passage boarding school. They didn't happen to me, but I heard the stories. They say that forgiveness brings peace, but peace is fickle. He never stays with any of us too long, so we go to bed early, stay up all night, fill pipes, empty bottles, do yoga, go to meetings, cut wrists, go to the gym, stay home, stay away, pop pills, meditate, look for ways out from under old hurts that seep like South Minneapolis arsenic into the soil that nourishes our roots. Maybe we can't help it that we poison the very things we try to sustain. Prick fingers as we try to stitch narratives from the threads of our own lives. Someone's child will carry these one day. Slip into them like old coats and say that it didn't happen to them. But they heard our stories. Thank you. One more time for Mercer Carr, please.
Thank you. Thank you. Give it up for Salads and Lipstick. That's the title of your next book, Salads and Lipstick. You're welcome. That's, that's it right there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so before we get um, on to our two feature artists of the evening, I just want to take a time, take a, just a quick second to thank our funders, CERDNA, Minnesota State Arts Board, and just a lot of folks who make these things possible. We pay everybody, we keep the costs low so that our show is accessible to everybody. Uh, we sometimes give out free beer and wine, and that means we have to find that money from somewhere. And uh, you know, Minnesota is just a great place for that, actually. You know, uh, we have a lot of writers saying they would totally move here if not for our winters uh, for that. So thank you, and, uh, and thank you to also to our members, the LOF members and community for sustaining us. It's, it's great and much, much appreciated. Are we ready for our first out-of-state guest? Yes? So Adam Faulkner is a writer, educator, and scholar. His work has appeared in a range of literary and academic journals and has also been appeared on, has appeared on HBO, NPR, BET, NBC, in the New York Times, and elsewhere. He is the founder and executive director of the pioneering diversity consulting initiative, The Dialogue Arts Project, and chief operating officer of Urban Word NYC, a nationally acclaimed youth literary arts organization. I didn't know writing, writing nerds could be COOs of something, so that's big, big, big props. A former high school English teacher in New York City's public schools, Adam has toured the US as a guest artist, speaker, and consultant, and was the featured performer at President, Ob President Obama's Grassroots Ball at the 2009 presidential inauguration. He teaches at Columbia University's Teachers College, where he is an Arthur Zanko Fellow and PhD candidate in the English and Education program. And I believe this is also Adam's first performance at the Loft. So please, a warm welcome to Adam Faulkner. Thank you, thank you. Um, honored to be here uh, for so many different reasons. Before I tell you about some of those, I'm going to ask, speaking of winter, uh, I've said this a couple times today, I've managed, I've tried to like stay inside. Fortunately, this city was built with like the idea that you might never want to go outside and everything is connected, uh, which for me is a sign that like maybe we shouldn't have settled somewhere in the first place if you don't ever have to go out. But in the spirit of it being a, uh, like a brick, 21 degrees out there, I'm, I'm going to ask you to help me warm up the space a little bit. Could you do that? Okay, cool. I'm going to follow that ask up with another ask, which is that you sing. Can you do that? All right. The one voice that was enthusiastic said, yup, followed it with a, Ugh. it's going to be, it's easy. It goes like this. It's one word, and it's a word that you already know what it is. The word is yeah. See? Sharp group. Goes like this. If y'all right, say you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Quickly, like, take a look on either side of you real quick. Just see who you're sitting next to. Now you know the face of the person refusing to participate in this exercise. <laughs> no, we'll try it again. We'll try it again. Doesn't matter how you sound. Just let's, let's get after it. If you're all right, say yeah. Yeah. Already warmer. If you're all right, say yeah. Yeah. And if you're all right, say yeah. Yes, if you're all right, say yeah. yeah. Okay, see, now you're trying to sing. Now you legit sound good. Now, this is a beautiful space. Thank you, and thank you for humoring me in that. Um, thank you to these wonderful writers, and of course, to Bao. I, th I think it's uh, an often overlooked fact, right? In, 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 his, in his introduction of The Loft, uh, he had multiple different occasions said, we had this good idea, or we had some really exciting things, and lo and behold, they funded it. Or we just got lucky, and they gave us money for this idea. Um, and as somebody that works in different nonprofit spaces uh, that aren't just sort of out here kicking up dust, um, that latter part is a really, really, really powerful testament to the work that is being done here. Um, and, and partly I think the work that's being sponsored and it's a really, really powerful thing to be here on these terms with these writers uh, 
to a very tightly run ship. So thank you very much for your work. Um, I'm working on a series. Yeah. I'm working on a series. Uh, it feels like it's never ending, but a series like this shouldn't. Um, and it is, it is chronicling um, my general development uh, as a young white boy through the lens of very specific album drops in hip hop when I was a kid. So like who I was when the Wu-Tang dropped and who I was when like the Blueprint dropped and then the Chronic and the Chronic dropped again and all these other albums, many of the poems are the same, but the title is The Whitest Thing. Oh, that's funny to you? <laughs> Just kidding, it's hilarious. Uh, and this is, this is that title piece, it's called The Whitest Thing. Owning your own white guilt is not cool yet. So you stuff the soft parts of other kids' cultures into your pockets until you believe that it is not there at all. You are a matching sweatsuit jukebox stocked with everything from Ice Cube to Outkast. Entire albums memorized and coiled in the damp of your throat, they are gunfire into the air above the high school parking lot. And that, well that is as black as you think possible and pulling blunts the size of magic markers into your small lungs before school is also black. And your dance routines are black. They call you Justin Timberlake. Your crossover is the blackest, though you are the only white boy on the court anyway. They call you Steve Kirk. <laughs> you used to stare at a freckle on your left arm and imagine your entire body that color. How much easier it would be to be you, if that were the case. And until someone tells you otherwise, that is black too. And it isn't that you don't know you're white, right? I mean, less white is all you'd really like to be. You are sure there's good parts about having white skin too, even if you cannot see them yet. Because no one asks you where you came from or how you got here which is good because you could not answer any cow. You just appear with an insatiable hunger to touch things that do not belong to you in a culture that fits like a bedsheet. No one calls you carpetbagger, tells you that you can't place your favorite things about black people into a single bucket and just try them on for years until it is time to come inside for dinner. And so you do exactly that. You dip your toe in and out, and you run when you must, but you stay when you choose. And that is the whitest thing of all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm working on a couple new poems right now about my, my grandmother um, and, and, and in the sort of vein uh, of, of where I'm at in my life at this moment. If you've ever had the, the experience of watching somebody age gracefully, um, you never know quite that that's a luxury until you watch someone sort of age not so gracefully, right? And if you've been in the position where you watch someone, you know, my grandma's was, she just passed away about three weeks ago and we're going home to memorialize her in Michigan uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, but toward the end of her life, she was sort of in and out and in and out. Sometimes she remembered who I was, a lot of times she didn't. And, and in my sort of preparing for her departure, sort of I need to, in my way of sort of making peace was it with, with it, was allowing myself to like have fun in the moments where it like wasn't pretty, um, just as a slow letting go, right? And sometimes she would remember me, sometimes she wouldn't. And um, I was there maybe like three months ago with my father and she referred to me, she called me Barack Obama. <laughs> And if you've ever been in the position where someone refers to you as Barack Obama and you legit, you know, they believe that you're Barack Obama, <laughs> you, you, might, you might roll with that for a minute, right? <laughs> I swear I'm not a terrible person, but you roll with that for a second. So just, the White House, oh, the White House is fine, Grandma, actually. I'm doing it. <laughs> so this poem, very creatively titled, is called My Grandma Calls Me Barack. My Grandma Calls Me John, Calls Me Jeff. Says she loved me in that new east of Eden and asked me by her bedside if I'm enjoying the White House. How that pretty Michelle is doing and if I've been able to get any sleep. 
She says she's ready to go home. Just unplug the spaghetti. Smells the meds in her milkshake from a mile away. No goody goo for me. No moxes for this foxes. No tricks in for this Nixon. Not me. I tell her the White House is fine, but it is a lot of responsibility. I'm going completely gray, as you can probably tell on TV. She clicks her molars softly to mirror the rain on the window outside, her eyes a glazy grizzle jumping from TV to window to ceiling, all those rooms she sighs. You must get lost. And I tell her I do, almost daily. It's hard to remember who I am with this whole healthcare business, this gay marriage thing, all these men on magazine covers diving into one another's mouths. Her eyes stop skimming the room, and they settle on the bottom of the eighth inning in the corner. She calls me Mark. She calls me Aaron. She squints and points a single bony finger in my direction, skin slipping off both sides like a wet rag draped over an oven handle. And she calls me nothing. When I say that he is a good looking man, I mean that objectively. As in, anyone who thinks otherwise might be so homophobic that they themselves are gay and I am not. Therefore, I appreciate how other people might be drawn to certain features that he holds. Now, when I say that I find him extremely handsome, Again, I would like to clarify that statement. I think of him as beautiful in that girls love him way. How, if I were a girl, I might wait outside his dressing room too. Write him love letters too. However, I am not, so I won't. But I get it. And even this poem said aloud in this very room, a flag javelined deeper into the cocksure certainty of my own Budweiser. So straight, that is that I could say I think about his stubble against my own without your thinking this poem is about to get gay as hell. <laughs> that glorious scrape and push of dueling jawlines, how I spend my commute on the two train most mornings, wondering how our college soccer hips might feel cutting into one another in the corner on the hood of a car in some hipster neighborhood I do not live in when no one knows me outside this splintered park bench, these rolled up jeans and faded button down, this orange magic hour on the East River, a single hairy tattooed arm laid lazy around my neck like a hitching post, while this giddy ribbon unravels inside me every time he cups my face in his palms. So. Um. Read two more quick ones. Um, a lot of my work rests at this sort of intersection of um, certainly narrative by nature, but I, I believe really, really strongly that art has the potential to draw us into dialogue with ourselves and with other people about things we otherwise would not engage with, right? Um, and that's sort of the founding principle of the Dialogue Arts Project, and I believe that's true in my, my work um, as an educator also. Certainly that's in my own writing. Um, and that is to say that if any of the writers tonight feel uh, like they've struck something in you, um, always follow up, right? Always say that to them. Um, sure, people have product and, and want to tell you about their work, but by all means, if there's anything that somebody has said that sticks to your ribs, uh, if we're not out here trying to generate conversation beyond this microphone and on the other side of the podium, then at times I get confused about what it is that we're doing then, right? Um, so, so, so be aggressive in hunting folks down if, if what they say speaks to you. This poem is called Adoption. There are men whose mouths my tongue has lapped through, whose stink and hum I've tasted in bar rooms too slicked over with whiskey and Whitney for anyone to know the wiser, who I could not help but offer outstretched in my slight hands when my mother asked, now that what's his name and I are done. What's next? Meaning, is dick the thing you are settling into? 
and onto. <laughs> and if so, that's fine, but are you thinking about adoption? <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> tonight, tonight, I think only of the streetlight on South Portland Ave. How it stripes a barber pole on his dancer's back, whose hands around neck mid-thrash, tongue wormed deep into the well of me, whose prickly chin I gulp, gnaw, roar of laughter into mourning. I think of that feral crave in a man's eyes, how it clings and does not give when it wants what I want. Says, this is the door through which we all walk. Wave to our families and say thank you or not and spring into the wind of another stiff body. Say, teach me to land. Take me into your fold, flock, mouth, humid crash of cave and skin. Spin me a new name. Just shove me into the sun. And uh, in the spirit of a conversation we had earlier this evening about the great state of Tennessee, uh, where <laughs> Christian had a long stay at an airport not too long ago in this great state, I'll let him tell you about that. Um, and in the spirit of thinking a lot about what I'm grateful for um, and how a lot of times I think that's at odds with my family, but I also, you know, we got to be careful about how we paint our families out here because... We always want something to push against, and we find it uh, as writers, right? But I try and, and read about my dad, um, who was a complex figure in my life, as a way of like continuing to hold him up. Um, and this is a poem called Fishing the Little Pigeon, uh, certainly about silence. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here on a really, really, really cold evening. Um, I'm honored and, and want to continue the dialogue, so, so let's talk. Thanks, y'all. This poem is called Fishing the Little Pigeon. Once, when you were 10 years old, you and your father wandered the bank of the Little Pigeon River for hours to find the perfect hole. A small cove buried in a quiet elbow of the river, the water black and frighteningly cold. A fallen pine bridged one side to the other, its roots gnarled against the muddy bank like broken fingers. He was trying to teach you the art of a good roll cast, to start with the rod tip down, to let the current pull the line out toward the darkest part of the river, and then, without warning, snap the wrist backward like a whip upstream. He stood behind you while you tried, his large hands cupped around yours so he could feel you feel how the line begged for trust, changed in the air like a tongue trying to find its blind way around the teeth of a lover's grinning mouth. Silence was the only rule. He wanted to teach you the one art he knew that didn't demand a word. Allowed grown men to sit beside a river, listen to the music in the trees with just their skin. Trust the silence between them like an offering. So he motioned you upstream for a new fly from his tackle. Your grandfather's ornaments of war. You peered inside the lid to find six cold bottles. Their sweaty green glass impossibly tempting, forbidden as a closed bedroom door. Glancing over your shoulder, you opened one and poured it down your throat all at once like a flame, just as you'd seen on TV a thousand times. You swallowed the last wretched bottle, dropped from the bottle, and tried to rub the burn from your lips, but it would not leave. And you marveled at the kind of man it must take to drink six of these in a single afternoon. How such poison didn't cripple him for the rest of his life. How the countless cardboard boxes in your garage mountained with empty bottles must have taken a lifetime's worth of this very burning to collect. How your father must have been the strongest man in the entire world. But when he broke the silence and called your name, something he had not done once in two years, you panicked. You hid the glass container beneath a patch of wet Tennessee dirt, stumbled down the water's edge, dizzy and drunk and teary-eyed, still perched on the bank, his cast graceful as cello music, 
He asked you for the fly he'd sent you after, asked what took so long. He asked why you were crying. He asked more questions in those 30 seconds than you could answer with mere head nods and shakes, afraid to curse the quiet of the river with the sound of your own voice, to be the kind of boy it takes to break a family tradition. But you said nothing. You protected that legacy with a fury, nodding and shaking until your tiny neck ached. All the while, another legacy, a much darker one, sliding neatly into your life without a word. Thank you, everybody. One more hand for Adam Faulkner. Awesome. Great job. Welcome to the loft. Welcome to Minnesota. Try to come back in the summer sometime. <laughs> Right. And uh, Adam, uh, thank you for the reminder. Uh, all the artists or some of the artists today might have product to sell after the show. Uh, come and find them. Uh, any money that you put in their pocket, the loft doesn't get a cut. It goes right to them. So buy guilt free. And then there's still there's also still some free booze out there, too. Uh, but don't drink it and then drive. To, um, <laughs> OK, because <that laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, no, I'm 40. I'm like everybody's dad right now. Don't drink and <laughs> Cut down on those beers, you had too many. Okay, um, so uh, our last artist for this evening is actually uh, the co-curator of this show, Christian Collier. Uh, he's the reason, he's one of the main reasons we're all here tonight. Um, he's a modern Renaissance man, um, in this case meaning poet, musician, educator, event host. And he's been called a street beatnik, spoken word rock star, and an artist to watch among many other mostly positive things. I don't know what those not positive things are, so that, that wasn't me. I, I'm just reading what I heard. <laughs> he is an accomplished artist and educator who has shared the stage with several members of HBO's Deaf Poetry cast, including legendary poet and activist Ishmael Reed, Grammy-nominated artist Minton Sparks, and has repeatedly been, fe been featured on the Indie Feed Performance Poetry Channel. Um, we're really glad uh, to have Christian Collier here this evening as a special spoken word Loft Immersion Fellow. And uh, please give a warm hand all the way from Tennessee, Christian Collier. Thank you. How are you guys doing? Shout it again. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Have you had a good time so far? Yeah. If you've had a good time, well, thank you. First of all, thanks for coming. Thanks for, for braving the elements. And um, yeah, I'm, I hail from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I will tell you a couple of Southern things uh, in the midst of these poems. You mentioned, uh, you know, you don't know what the, the not so positive things are. We'll get to some of those. So uh, my first poem I'm going to start with tonight, um, I actually wrote it 11 years ago. And it's a, it's a trippy thing that it's uh, still relevant. And it's also kind of heartbreaking at the same time. So uh, this is called This Poem, because I'm a genius. Some say poets write to ward off death and preserve immortality. But that is not the significance of this poem for me. This poem knows that life goes on regardless of elections and that people still need jobs, still starve, still catch hell for being black or Muslim or Hispanic. This poem believes that freedom and responsibility should be so close that they can't fake orgasms. This poem does not believe in democracy because it has yet to breathe in this country. And even though this poem may have lost its faith in government, it has never lost its faith in God or people. This poem was born in the household of Orion and does not believe in the art of being quiet. This poem was born with wings in a nest of my chest and throats, and it soars out of my voice to wrap around in neglected bones like fog. This is for those whose skin is sinking due to the AIDS virus, and for those that love love in all of its shapes and sizes. For those who work their fingers to the dust to give their children all they can. For the ex-con who's trying to find work but can't due to prior mistakes. For those that collect our trash and clean our rooms whose names we never bother to learn. For those who have ever had to sacrifice their dreams in order to bring their realities to life, this poem is for white boys wanting to be black. Thinking they can through hip-hop, smoking weed, and oversized t-shirts. 
We all know a few. This poem is for those who think that terrorism has a face that does not look like yours. Wake up. This is for those whose friends and family shield them from being responsible. Grow up. This poem is for the guy who's in here somewhere who thinks that I kind of look like Morpheus. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> With love. <laughs> See, this poem is for me. For long nights and here's with eyes that ache. For the brother that I almost lost last year to flames and the sister who still busts my balls and calls me names. This is for the me and me I hope never dies. The me that unfortunately sometimes gives birth to lies. This poem is for Minneapolis and its cold black skies. This is for the poems inside of our blood. For the words that we just can't hide. For the black souls who have their lives stolen back when lynching was this country's favorite pastime. For everyone within the sound of my voice, this poem, this poem is for all of us. Because your silence is a timeless enemy. Speak up. Just so you know, I still love you if you think I look like Morpheus. I get Ike Turner and Furious Styles every now and again, too. So um, one of the things that the, uh, the Law Fellowship has allowed me to do is that I've, I've spent the majority of this year doing a project which uses poetry to explore race as well as sex and gender. And uh, the way that that works is that I have conducted interviews with people and for people who are freaked out by interviews, we have coffee and conversation. It tends to be a little bit more casual. But um, my job from then is to take what they have said and to kind of shape it and make art out of it and make poetry. So uh, I wanted to share a couple of poems with you from that series. And uh, this first one is, uh, actually was just featured in Voicemail Poems, their, their fall edition. And uh, it's called How It Feels to be Black. And I have to say that it's really interesting doing these two poems in particular in light of what's currently going on in your city, as well as what happened last Friday in the, in the nation. Well, not even in the nation. You know, we've, we've kind of like taken it and made it our own thing, but it, it didn't happen in our nation. But How It Feels to be Black. It feels like God doesn't love us. Like there is no gospel in the gusts of wind that sometimes wrap around us. It feels like all of the prayer and preaching, all of the song and celebrating the word doesn't seem to help us. Doesn't protect us from the grip of injustice. Doesn't defend us from those who have descended upon us and stripped the life from our bodies. It feels like there is a bounty on our backs, like we are destined to keep dying unarmed and at fault. It feels like the angels have abandoned our skies and heaven, heaven will not have us. Thank you. Um, Hopefully none of you will, uh, will find fault with me saying this, but uh, this next poem is one that I'm sure that Donald Trump would hate. <laughs> you know, you, you got to be careful. You know, you never know. It's, it's, it's that season. <laughs> this is called Muslim, Not Murderer. And just so you know, um, in July, it was July 16th. Uh, Chattanooga, where I'm from, made national headlines. We made national news, and I think it's always a surreal thing when that happens, which, again, you guys know, right? Um, we had a, uh, a shooter uh, target uh, two military installations, and we ended up on CNN. Um, since then, we've, we've kind of been on this Chattanooga Strong campaign, and now we've reached a point where, like, whenever something happens, it's that place strong, right? It's Boston Strong, Chattanooga Strong. And, uh, and that, that's cool. I think the, the intention of it is that in, in light of tragedy, we, we come together as a community. In reality, that's not always the case. And I think whenever it happens in your own neck of the woods, you kind of start to see that and question what exactly does it mean to be Chattanooga strong or Boston strong. Uh, in light of the shooting, you know, we had the, the, the community gatherings, and then we also had a hotbed of Islamophobia. 
after last Friday, we come together to show our support for Paris and show our Islamophobia. It, it tends to become a cyclical thing. So, Muslim, not murderer. I did not know the shooters. I never met them. Never watched them pray. Never rested my gaze on their mother's faces. I did not know the shooters. My sympathies are for their victims, families, friends, and even them. I am sorry that such a mighty burden would fall upon them and drive them to illicit chaos. I am sorry for the bruised souls everyone involved in their tragedy has been forced to wear. But I am no terrorist, have never wished to destroy anything or anyone, have never received word from Allah to demolish what his hands have built. I am Muslim, not murderer, and I will not, cannot, bring myself to apologize for this which I had no hand, no heart in. I will not, cannot, bring myself to apologize for the shooter's sins because I know in the very marrow of my making that evil neither knows religion nor serves any god. My beliefs, which have bettered my spirit and family, are not accountable for this disaster. My voice has grown strained and raspy from shouting over and over like some sort of ardent mantra that I am an innocent man and I did not know the shooters. Thank you. So, Bao, you mentioned that you're not on Twitter, but, but Donald Trump very much is. So, if you post this on any social media and I see Donald Trump, what's this? Thank you for the, the, the free publicity. We'll switch it up. We'll do some love poems. We'll do some different kind of love poems, though, you know. Proud Scorpio. As is Adam, actually. Any other Scorpios in the house? One of you. Maybe one and a half. I don't know. I didn't get to see. <laughs> so this, this first one is called Angel. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to write a poem about what it's like to, to fall in love with like an actual angel. Uh, I was not on drugs when I wrote the poem. <laughs> I was very much on drugs afterwards, you know. It's very important to keep the timeline straight, you know. So uh, how many people are in relationships? Wifed up? It's cuffing season? Okay, good number of you. Uh, in Chattanooga, they're like 12 single people, you know. So it's always an interesting thing where you're like, oh, they're actually single people. They exist. So uh, there's a good chance that uh, the opening might be telling some of your stories. We'll, we'll see. We'll find out. I was drunk when I met you. But even then, even then I didn't want to let you go. See, I was too afraid that the world would capture you and never give you back to me. So I claimed you during our initial conversation, and weeks later, the first night you fell asleep in my arms, your face turned and lax on the bridge of my chest, I knew that you loved me. I felt both vulnerable and secure with me, and Lord, how happy I was. It felt as if a small sun had risen up inside me. You embraced me and proceeded to do things that completely consumed me, angel, and what man who was residing in his right mind wouldn't want a concubine whose spine was designed with wings, whose mouth knew the flavor of the sky, whose hazel eyes knew what slept above the clouds? Sweetheart, I swear, I even used to taste God when we kissed. But eventually, at some point in our relationship, I realized that the only thing that we were relating to was distance, both miles and nights apart, and I knew that the world had started changing when I began finding fallen feathers sleeping in the bathtub. It was then that I came to understand that I was witnessing your divinity die, and I could hear the faint whistle of the end drawing near like the mighty winds of a tornado. I could feel you pulling away in those moments right before sleep would claim us, or in the early morning when I would leave for work and the front door would stall before coming closed. I could feel you drifting beyond my breath, and the weight of another man anchoring the bed sheets that we shared. Even then, angel, I still joined hands, clenched eyes, and cast prayers that no harm would come to mar your body. I prayed for you as though your pastel palms never pushed me away. Angel, when you left, you gifted me music, gave my waking body the sound of your wings drumming against the air and your torso. And even though it is still a sobering feeling to wake up three times in a single night and realize that it is over that 
there is nothing left to barter or give that the other side of the bed will be indefinitely light and empty, sweetheart, that your warmth, your warmth is now gone. I choose to remember the good times, those all too brief days and nights when something far larger and greater than the both of us held us up happily together in the grip of love. Thanks. So about five years ago, I was at a diner uh, having a, a man talk with uh, one of my good friends. Ladies, you have no idea you know, about any of this. I'm strictly talking to the fellas right now. We're having one of those man talks, you know, getting together with your boy and everything. And uh, we're talking about what it's like to grow up in the South. And uh, my friend is, uh, is white. If you have not noticed, I obviously am black. Um, I don't have her first vitiligo. And um, we're, we're kind of talking about the different things that we encountered. And uh, so after we parted ways, I went home, I wrote this poem. And he hates this poem. I have two that he hates. And it's not because he, he hates the poem itself. He hates the fact that I had to go through what actually happened in the poem. So. This is called acceptance. After an absence of seven years, I find my first love and learn that she is now a mother. And it is strange to think that she has held a life in the dark hands of her womb. No longer is she the girl smiling in the photographs perched along my bedroom wall. After an absence of seven years, it is as if our mouths never abandoned the melody of each other's names and I'm hearing her full, rich, laugh anew. Through the course of our conversation, we both choose to keep the sweetness present. We have unconsciously agreed not to wait into our bruised history. We do not speak of what we have both lived through together, but it is still alive and lying atop our veins. I do not have far to reach to remember the sting of the word nigger, tumbling like hail out of her father's lips toward me. I can still remember her eyes shining like soft moons in the dark as she asked me to leave her 17th birthday party so that her parents would not know that I had come to celebrate her honor. I can still remember how often I clasped my hands and prayed for God to grant me a different world to wake to instead of this hungry South whose pride and tradition towered like a grim juggernaut of a choice. She stands before me, happy, Beaming like the new morning with her infant asleep in her arms, I realize that both distance and time are the midwives of acceptance. And though I doubt our tongues will ever admit it, I know. I know that we've made our peace with who we were all those years ago, when we were as vulnerable as thin ice, and only just learning the true weight contained in our care for one another. When we both came to know that I, I had the heart to love her, just not the skin. I have one more poem for you guys. Just one more and I'll be out of your hair. Again, uh, before we get to that though, please clap it up for everybody who's touched the stage tonight. Charlotte, Marissa, Adam. Again, uh, a good number of us have uh, merch for sale, uh, but just like Adam said, you know, we, we, we mainly dig interaction. Uh, I think most of us will probably hug you for free too. So if you want quality hugs, we can make that happen tonight. I feel like I just upped the ante. Not just hugs, quality hugs, you know. Step your hug game up, son. But um, last year, uh, my, my mother was in the hospital for, for three months, and we were pretty sure that she wasn't going to make it. And fortunately, she did. She came out of it. So I wrote this poem, and uh, I debuted it in Nashville. The... Uh, the day before Mother's Day, uh, on Mother's Day, I came back into town. Uh, I did the poem for her. And, you know, my, my mother's not vain at all. She's like, oh, I love it. Now you have to do it every time you get in front of people. So I'll do what I can. So even though this poem is about my mother, hopefully uh, your mothers have a place in this as well. Uh, also, if, if some of you guys are mommies, maybe you're in it too. So this is called Mama Said. When I was younger, my mother told me that no one knew more about love and life 
than her and Sam Cooke. <laughs> she was right. And while I never met the latter, she was the first God I ever knew, made divine through both motherhood and will. And she brought camera to my body long before language rested in the bends of my tongue. See, my father fashioned me a man, but she taught me to be a warrior, told me to be mindful of the battles I chose to undertake, because each one is not worthy of bloodshed or pain. She told me long ago that love makes boxers out of us all. It places us in the hub of the ring and ushers us to the cusp of exhaustion. So I learned then to develop a champion's chin, and even though my back has met the face of the canvas, I've always got back up, always reached inward and willed myself upright. When I was a teenager, first formulating who I wanted to become and slowly shedding boyhood, my mama told me, never chase anyone who does not want to be caught or who is unworthy of the pursuit because your energy should be focused on those who both want to be found as well as found in your life. She said, always handle broken people with care because it is their nature to cut deeply. Always guard your heart from those who will recklessly cast jabs at it and remember that that beautiful muscle behind your breast will never break. It will just bruise badly on occasion but keep beating until it silently segues into retirement someday in the future. She said, son, never ever relinquish your faith because it is your ability to see the face of God in the dark. Son, whenever you utter an I love you, be as certain of your feelings as a soldier, squeezing the trigger of a rifle. Son, be careful of the doors that you open, because sometimes the ghosts from your past can blow in on any given strand of the wind and haunt you anew. And please, promise me that you will make this your soul's mantra. May that which does not uplift me, forget me, and permit me to carry on my journey unburdened. See, friends, the older I get, the more I realize that it is because of her strength and wisdom that I stand before you tonight, perched behind the ports of this microphone. So many of the principles that have governed my life have come directly from the likes of her advice. And the very pieces of this poem, plus the breath that I seldom notice entering and leaving my body, are her doing. And I hope that she knows that this, this is my humble attempt to honor her by declaring proudly to the world, Mom, I am who I am, what I am flaws and all because you chose to love me. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Clap it up for yourselves for stepping out the house. Thanks to Bow, the, lo the Loft people. Thank you. Can we make some noise one more time for the artists, Charlotte, Marissa, Christian, Adam. Big ups to DJ Chamun, to Josh Daru, to Brown Town, Asher Eads. And really, sincerely, thank you all for being here. Um, feel free to get some drinks outside, mingle and interact with the artists. Even if you um, don't buy their stuff, chat with them. Uh, get, their, get their website down, follow their work, support their work, artists need you. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Have a good night.